Good morning everyone, I trust you're well as we approach this Sunday. I hope that we can get some encouragement through our worship in various places, hopefully from this channel and uh, certainly from our Bible reading challenge today as we take our next step into the chapters in uh, the letter to the Ephesians, Paul to the Ephesians, as he wrote there to a congregation that had been established in Ephesus. And I made comments yesterday that as we work our way through this particular letter, there are all sorts of things to, to bear in mind and to find interesting uh, because Paul picks up a number of different topics. So I hope you will find some encouragement with that and traveling through this journey throughout this week. But I don't intend to speak, intend to speak too long because um, obviously we've got other forms of worship to get into today as well. So let's, let's get straight into Ephesians chapter 2 and see some of the um, the distinctions, I think is probably the best way to put it, that are made between different peoples and different conditions. You'll see what I mean when we make some comments hopefully afterwards, and certainly through the reading itself. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of power, the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not for your, your sorry, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the hands by flesh, sorry, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, by make, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hill hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Amen. Now I want to get straight into probably a, a main single topic here about the sense of the being others, us and the other. It's talked of in psychological terms as well. It's very easy to make somebody else the other, an other group, the world at large, that terrible world around and about us, for example. Those people who are so very different from ourselves, those terrible people, thieves and murderers or whatever else it is that you might want to, want to add 
of the other group. They're a terrible group. They're strange. They're strangers. They're, they're refugees. They're immigrants. They're, um, they're people who've never worked a, a, a solid day in their lives. They're sponges. They take of uh, everything that we've got in society and they give nothing back. Those other people. That's very often a variety of terms that are, are leveled at other human beings who ultimately are just like ourselves. We're very good at casting distinctions between one another based on color of skin, based on language or, or just an accent. And um, we're very good at making them the other. We're the in crowd and they are the other. And we see that throughout life. Human beings are not just fickle, but they are incredibly tribalistic. You're not in our gang, in our tribe. And so it takes a long while, perhaps, to let somebody come in uh, into our own circles. As I was growing up in the Isle of Lewis, very often it was those people who were called incomers, people who came into the island. It wasn't necessarily folk who were English, for example. It could have just been that they were from another part of Scotland or another part of the world. They were incomers. And when I, I moved down to Lanarkshire in, uh, in Scotland here uh, for the first time, uh, it was the first time living in a, a small town there that I had been called an incomer. And it was a strange experience to be thought of as other. My children were born in that town. Now, time will tell whether or not they're ever also viewed as incomers because their parents were incomers, even though they were actually born physically within that town. So that continues on unless you're several generations into living into a particular place. And of course, different cultures and different uh, places have, have different views about that and to what extent that um, is, is a problem for, for people who live in that particular vicinity. The other. The, the Jews had that view of anybody who wasn't a Jew. They were of the circumcision. They are the ones that held the promises of God. Everybody else was other. They were Gentiles. They were unclean. They were uncircumcised. And so this distinction was made. And that was very difficult even in the early church for those who were Jewish Christians to kind of shake that and, and, and throw it away, acknowledging that those who were Gentile Christians were also Christians. They'd been brought together. And Paul really strikes out that today, talking about the way that Christ himself in his body and in his death and resurrection brought together these two groups, the in crowd and the other. And he broke down everything that separated, he broke down the hostility, the animosity, and he brought together in one body, one piece, a single people. So there might not be others in that kind of sense. I want to pick up another thing as well with regards to where we think about others, and that's in respect to the distinction we make. Very artificial distinction, actually, when we look at the promises of Scripture. The distinction we make between the living and the dead. They've died. They're no longer within our sight. They are the other. There's a sense in which, with regards to dead bodies, that they are viewed as unclean. And there is a sense, of course, that you know, decomposing flesh or, or, or anything is, is eventually unclean from, from a hygiene point of view. But, but, that, but that's not really the point I'm trying to make here. That which is dead is seen as other. And we fear for it. Of course, we have the promises of God that there is a life beyond this but do we view it as this is our life and then we die and become something other and then hopefully we'll be reunited with those who died up in heaven it's another step entirely or do we view it from the perspective that we have revealed in scripture about God that he views everybody as living the living and the dead are the same before him because that transition from one state into the other in his eyes, is, is the same thing. It's just a step, literally a step. Um, you know, going through a door from one room into another room. Okay, the people in one room can't see the people in the other room, but they're, they're still human beings. They're still people. They're still people that he loves, and he views them as living as well. There's also this sense right at the very start of this chapter of those who are dead in their trespasses and in their sins, a different state again. But, but they're still human beings. They're physically alive, but they're dead in a different sense in that they are still there in their, their sins, in their trespasses, in their mistakes. And there's a question as to whether or not God can even look upon them. And yet God looks upon all of us through that lens of Christ with favour and with blessing. 
So again, there's, there's an otherness about that as well. And I, and I draw that to our attention this morning because I just want to highlight that there are different states. Um, we can be alive in the flesh, but we can still be an other. We can be sinful. We can be thieves and murderers and all the other things that I mentioned. I'm just picking out these two things, not for any particular uh, reason there, but, but the, the categories that sometimes we use and, and look down on people in those categories. Um, you know, we, we, we can be alive, physically living, breathing and walking around, but dead to the world. And particularly people who are incarcerated into prison and put away and buried in the prison, we, we think of them almost as being as good as dead, if you like in that sense it's a terrible way to, to view it but there's a real, reality to that when people are physically dead that also holds they're still living in god's sight and um, though they're put away from our own vision and, and buried as it were in, in death be it a grave or or whatever means has been taken to, to dispose of the physical remains of an individual but um there's a distinction that's made there and the jews had this as well I hope you get and grasp what I'm, I'm trying to get at there, that, that there's a sense in which we can be physically alive and yet at the same time dead, holding two states at the same time, dead in our trespasses, um, dead spiritually speaking, dead as a doornail, um, you know, unresponsive, not necessarily unresponsive to physical stimuli or conversation, Intellectual conversation, for that matter, not necessarily dead to our emotions, though some can, can be expressed as being like that, but, but dead spiritually speaking. Dead also in our state of what we know of the promises of God and having accepted them, dead, 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 other, other, other. But Christ brings all these things together and God views us as living before him. And it's just what kind of state do we find ourselves in? I hope I've not made that more complex than it was in the first place. <laughs> I really do. But the, the encouragement here, I think, for today is that whatever our state, God's showing his love for us. He's giving us opportunities to, to, re, re, um, to, to be reconciled and to respond to that love and to reciprocate. That's the word I was looking for, to reciprocate that love. Um, we, we can be dead in our trespasses and sins. We make mistakes. We continue to make mistakes. I'll talk more about this a little bit later in our, our service, again on this channel, uh, our, our main day um, uh, service of worship, about the idea of trespass or, or sin, sin and forgiveness, most importantly. Uh, much on forgiveness. But the importance is that you know, whatever our state, however other we might feel, the Christ is trying to draw us to himself and reconcile us so we all might be one together in him, in his peace, reconciled to God. <coughs> I think there's, there's a lot we can learn from what Christ has done for us in our, <coughs> excuse me, in our relationships with one another. How quick are we to be tribalistic? How quick are we to view other people as other That's a little better. Um, really, the, the encouragement of Scripture here is that rather than making these artificial distinctions and pushing people away from ourselves, we should be more encompassing, more inclusive of one another and, and loving our neighbour as ourselves. We're all brought into the one in Christ, regardless of what our past might have been and even what our present is. Can we try to be one in Christ, enjoying all that he has purchased for us? I think I'll leave it at that. Let's have a wee word of prayer and get on with our day, shall we? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that through Christ you have brought us together and made us one. We are one human race. We are one creation. We are part of your creation. A creation at which at one point was stated it was very good. We pray, Lord, that we would look at one another with the eyes of love that you look upon your creation with. We might be different in different ways. There might be artificial distinctions that we make, but help us to see that in Christ we can be reunited with one another, with our very selves, and most importantly with you. Help us to look upon everyone kindly, regardless of their background and regardless of, of these distinctions that might otherwise be made. Help us as we approach this Lord's day, looking to you in faith through Christ. 
Amen. I do hope you have a great day and that you'll continue on as we look at other topics as we work through this letter to the Ephesians. But until the next time, God bless, take care and bye for now.